morning, church. How are you guys doing this morning? You doing good? Come on. It's good to be in church today. Hey, my name is Micah, and I'm so happy you all are here. If it's your first time here to Church on the Move, we want to bless you this morning. All you got to do is pull out your phone and text new here or text new to 23101. And we'll send you a $5 Starbucks gift card. Like I said, text new to 23101 and that gift card is yours, all right? I've got some amazing news for you all this morning. If you didn't know, starting this last Thursday night and going all the way up until yesterday morning at 7 a.m., we pulled an all-nighter. We had our uncommon summer youth experience. Come on. It was so awesome. It was so good. All the student ministries over all of our campuses, we have just under 500 kids come together as one to lift up the name of Jesus and God moved in such a big way. Here's what he did. 13 kids dedicated their life to Christ. 83 students got water baptized at about two in the morning. The whole small group was filled with the Holy Spirit. There were healings, there were miracles. God moved in a big way. Come on church, you can do better than that. Come on, come on, lives were changed. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, God is moving in this church. He's moving in this house. He has something for you all this morning. So let's raise our expectations, all right? Before we jump back to worship, turn around. Be nice to the people around you. Introduce yourself, and then we'll get back to worship, all right? Come on.
something we're facing specifically you're here with us you're here with us and you give us hope thank you oh how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide oh how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the earth Oh, how long have I chased the rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from a source of its supply? Cause in the highlands and the heart, you need the more. I would search and stop at nothing Cause you're just not that hard to find Thank you So I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are Praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadow. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. Cause you're the hand and where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. From where your feet rest on the sunrise To where you sweep the sinners pass In the how fast would you come running If just a shadow be through the night Trace my steps through all my failure And walk me 
Maybe questioning the hope of Jesus. If it's really true, if it really can save me. What this song is beautifully, beautifully illuminating is that it doesn't matter if you feel great. It doesn't matter if you feel like life is going well. You may be feeling like life is going terribly right now. But the hope of Jesus is that he can meet you right where you are. And he can lead you into a life of grace and fullness and hope. That's our hope today. We're not singing from another place, but from that place together. So come on, let's lift our voice. Let's sing together. I will praise you from the mountain. Wherever you find yourself today. I will praise you in the mountains in the way. You're the summit where. Run right where you stand. He's there. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No. Yeah. 
Your love is tender. Sing again. I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valleys of the sea. No less God within the shadow. No You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Church, it doesn't matter where you find yourself right now Our God is deserving of the biggest praise that we can give Him Because He sent Jesus for us So right now, lift your voice Tell Him thank you Oh, man. Thank you guys so much for singing with us. Go ahead and have a, have a seat. Praise Jesus. We're going to continue to worship right now. If you brought something that you'd like to give today, you can go ahead and get that ready. We're going to worship as we give to Jesus. If this is your first time, if you're still kind of getting used to how we do things, there's no pressure to be involved. But if you want to participate, and worship God through giving, you can uh, do it one of a few ways. You can go to cotm.info, go to that website, just follow the giving prompts. You can also use the envelope in the seat back in front of you. And uh, the other option is you can text to give. Text the number 23101, and you can text the word give um, to give that way. And also with that number, um, if there may be some of us here, which I can guess that there may be some of us here, that it does feel like we're right up against the mountain. It feels like something's facing us. And man, just prayer would be amazing. Let us serve you in that way. Would you text prayer to 23101? That way a real person can be on the other end of that request, believing and agreeing with you. We believe Jesus hears us when we pray. Um, so please, if that's you, take advantage of that. Let's do this. Let's pray over our giving and we'll uh, continue on our service. Jesus, you're so good. Thank you for giving us space as a family to lift up our voice, to worship you by giving to you. You first gave to us everything. You've shown us that you love us, and that love is transformative from the inside out. And so, God, we just give with ultimate gratitude today, knowing that you have received our worship. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I get the honor of welcoming our speaker today. He's our BA campus pastor. His name is Ethan Vance. And um, oh yeah, yeah, I know a lot of you know him. <laughs> so, so he and his wife Sarah have been an unbelievable part of our family here for a long time. Just recently they moved away to California uh, to follow Jesus' plan for their life. But now, they are back, and he is going to preach today, and I'm so excited for you to hear his message of hope. Sarah, Ethan, we love you dearly. We love you dearly, and we are so 
stoked that you and your family are back. So Church on the Move, stand up with me. Give a huge homecoming welcome to Ethan Vance. Hey, come on, make some noise for Jesus this morning. Man, it's great to see you. Don't you wish, don't you wish that everywhere you went there was just a band playing behind you when you walked in the room? It feels great. Hey, do this. Spread some joy around you. Welcome somebody to church. Say, this is going to be great. Then have a seat. Got Jordan sweat all over me. Hey, it's great to see you this morning. If you are new to Church on the Move and you stood up just because everybody else was standing up, man, I love you. You're my kind of people. That's awesome. And my wife Sarah and I, like Jordan said, have been in California uh, for a season. We've been leading a church out there, and God has just done miraculous things. It was a church that went through a tough season, uh, but God is in the resurrection business, amen? And he brings dead things back to life, and that's exactly what happened out there. And uh, so God brought us through a season uh, of uh, obviously staying very, very closely connected to WIT and everything here at the church and the team and our friends. And through that season, uh, God made it very obvious that we were out there to, for a very specific assignment and that we were uh, to come back to Oklahoma for a very specific assignment because we believe that God has the best days of church on the move in front of us. Do you believe that? And uh, so we are back. And so the, uh, first, I just want to say thank you. Uh, there's been so much kindness shown to Sarah and I, so many uh, nice things and, and warm welcome coming back. So thank you to everybody that's reached out. Uh, somebody made me a peanut butter pie and brought it to me last night. Come on, that's just like Jesus right there. <laughs> welcome back to the South, baby. This is where people make you pie in church. It's great to be home. Uh, but the number one question that we got, I think, during the season of us kind of coming back is why? Uh, why would you come back from California to Oklahoma? And obviously the answer is the weather. Uh, praise God for humidity. I walked out of a restaurant yesterday, and my sunglasses fogged up. True story. Like, come on, Oklahoma, what are we doing? And, uh, but but uh, really, the answer is, is, is much deeper than even just what we see at Church on the Move, because uh, our relationship with Wit and Gabe runs to the heart of who we are. Uh, if you didn't know, I grew up at Church on the Move, and Witt and Gabe growing up, if, you, if, you, if you're new, by the way, I apologize if you don't know who any of these people are, uh, uh, Witt and Gabe are brothers. Witt is our lead pastor. Gabe is his younger brother, and he serves as our senior pastor at our South Campus. We have a campus that meets in the south part of the city. Uh, and their dad is Willie George, who's the founding pastor of Church on the Move. Well, growing up as part of this church, they were like my brothers. And I have four sisters, so when it was just too much estrogen, hair bows, and Barbie dolls in my house, I would go hang out with them. And, and uh, they were like brothers. But as I grew up, my family went through a rough season. My parents, when I was in high school, ended up separating and then eventually divorcing. And during that season, their friendship and their brotherhood with me was more than just fun. It was a lifeline for me. I would go spend the night crashed on their garage apartment floor that their dad had made so that they kept the noise of all the friends away from mom. Amen. And we, we would just have those nights out in, the, in, in their room talking. And those were lifelines for me. That's where I found a new hope and a new picture for my future. Because getting around their family, I learned something. That when you honor God and you put him first, a different future is possible. It doesn't matter what past you came from. It doesn't matter how difficult things were. When you put God first, he always has a way of breakthrough for your future. And that's what I learned being around them. And so during this season, what we've discovered is that God has put a similar vision in each one of our hearts tied together. That we would create as many rooms across this city that would be like garage, apartment floors where people can come in and crash and drop their baggage and drop all their junk from their past to get a new future that God has for their future. So you want to know why I'm back? That's why I'm back, baby, because I believe that God has that kind of future for our church. Do you believe that? And I hope that's why you're a part of the church. Maybe you're in a season where you're just coming in and dropping your bags, or maybe God's been good to you and you get to be a part of us spreading that hope to others. But that idea that we are hope dealers is why we decided to spend the first four weeks of teaching together in this new way with senior pastors teaching at all of these locations, talking about hope, is because we believe that hope is the spark that starts the fire of God's future in your life. And if you missed the first couple weeks, we're actually in week three uh, this weekend, it's totally fine. The big idea of the whole series is really, really simple, and it's just this, that God wants you to have a hope that's unshakable. 
There's a lot of things that we can have hopes in in our life, but God wants us to have a deep, abiding, capital H, eternal hope that cannot be shaken no matter what life throws at you. So I brought this because I think this is a perfect picture of the kind of hope that God wants us to have. You remember these when you were little? These were great for me because I couldn't hit my sisters, but I could hit these. Like you can go full Chuck Norris on these. You can punch them. You can, you can kick them. You can knock them down. You can tackle them. But every time you do it, what happens? They pop back up. Now these are great in California because you can put them in the passenger seat of the car and drive in the carpool lane. It's awesome. <laughs> but the novelty of these, the novelty of these is really, really simple, isn't it? It's just you knock it down, it comes back up. But the power of how it functions is not in its strength. This toy is not particularly strong. The reason that it's resilient is not because of its strength. It's flimsy. It's made of plastic and it's filled with air. It is not strong on its own. The reason that it's resilient and it can rebound no matter what I do to it is because it's connected to something I can't touch. Come on. It's connected to a foundation that is unshakable, that's untouchable, and no matter what happens to it, it has a power connected to its roots that allows it to come back. That's the kind of hope that God wants you to have. Now, the problem is this, is that when we start talking about hope, you can say, Ethan, that's awesome. That's awesome for optimistic people. That's awesome for extroverted people. That's awesome for morning people. Come on, this is the 11 a.m. service. Anybody in here not a morning person? You're like, don't bother me. Come on, you're my, man, we can be friends. We're going to get along great. Listen, I'm not a morning person. I don't think anybody that schedules a meeting before 9 a.m. can possibly love Jesus. It's just not possible. <laughs> but my wife is a morning person, and every morning she gets up, she just pops out of bed. She opens the blinds. Hello, world. It's like a Disney movie every time she wakes up. So she goes downstairs. She has her devotion. And she always greets me in the morning with all of this enthusiasm. In fact, she did this to me yesterday morning. I walked out. When I, when I wake up, it's like a vampire hitting the sunshine. It's like, just what is happening right now? And she comes running up to me. She gives me a hug and a kiss. And she just says, Ethan, I had the best morning. I had my coffee. I had my devotional. God's been telling me all this stuff. I had great worship. You want to help me? You want me to help you preach this weekend? I was like, whoa, babe, that's a lot first thing in the morning. If there's people like that in your life, it can be easy to think that that's hope. And you just think, man, I'm, I'm not like that. Ethan, this isn't me at all. This, listen, listen, you want to see me? That's me. Just like, I'm a little more pessimistic. I'm a little more pragmatic. I just don't have that bubbly thing in me. And here's what I want you to hear. Hope is not just your personality or your optimistic outlook on life. Hope is an anchor, as Hebrew tells us, for our soul, that no matter what happens to us, we can have confidence in the future. And I believe this, no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter what's been happening to you or what you've gone through, you can build this kind of hope. It is possible. And if you're just starting out, in fact, I had this conversation with my teenage son last night, and he said, Dad, this series has been awesome for me because I haven't really hit a lot of things in my life that have broken my heart. But it's awesome to know that no matter what I hit, it doesn't have to wreck my life because I can put my hope someplace else. So whether you're just starting out or you've had a season where you need new hope, I believe it's possible for you to build that kind of hope. And so today I just want to do this. I just want to give you three things, three hope builders, three things that I think you can walk out of these doors and do this week that will build your hope no matter where you are. The first one is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. You can find all of our notes, by the way, at cotm.info if you want to follow along. But the first one is this. Write it down. Choose action over inaction. Choose action over inaction. This is what you need to know. Action and hope are partners. They are always linked together. Any time in your life where you feel like you don't know what to do and action, visible progress in your life starts to slow down, your hope level will follow it down. And any time something happens to you where your hope level drops, we tend as human beings to stop and freeze. If we don't know how it's going to end, sometimes we don't feel like we know where to start. And if you're in a season where you're not sure what you're supposed to do, maybe it's because you have a lot of options and you just feel like, Ethan, I don't know which one is connected to my future and I'm not sure where this is going to end. Or maybe you're on the opposite side. You feel like all the options are gone and you have no way to move forward. Here's what happens when our hope tank is empty. Our action steps are lacking. We feel like we don't know what to do because we don't know how it's going to turn out. And if that's you, I just want you to do this during this series. Just exhale. Give yourself lots of grace. Can I just pastor you for a second? Sometimes as we follow Jesus, there's this feeling of guilt when we don't have the end picture in mind. We go, I, Ethan, I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't know how it's, I don't know, I don't know exactly where I'm going to end up. And we feel like maybe, maybe God just hasn't given me what he's given you. And we feel maybe guilty or less than. That's not the story of following Jesus. 
Every person that's ever followed God has had that same feeling that they don't know what to do. It is human nature to freeze when we don't know how something is going to work out. The other day, I, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning because I heard a noise. Have you had one of those mornings where you, like, you hope your, your wife will get up and go investigate it because you don't really want to get out of bed? So I, my wife wouldn't move, so I had to go do it. So I'll get out of bed, and I get you know, sort of that cobweb, foggy feeling, and I'm walking downstairs. The house is dark. And when, at the bottom of the stairs in our house, there's this wall. And when you look around this wall, you can see just part of our backyard. And at night, normally that part of our backyard is totally dark. And, and there's, a hot, there's a hot tub over there, but you can't see it at night because it's dark. But I walk around the corner, and I can see that the lights are on, and the jets are going, and the top is off. And there are people moving around in my hot tub. Somebody has jumped the fence and decided to have a 3 a.m. party in my hot tub. So I did what any red-blooded American would do. I hid back around the wall. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there, and I'm I, like, I, I can't think straight, and I'm just wondering, do I yell back upstairs and ask my wife to go talk to him? Do you call 911? Is there a hotline for party jumper, the people jumping? I don't know what, what to do. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm having this moment just kind of frozen. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, I'm a man. And so <laughs> I walk back around the wall, and I'm giving myself that pep talk, going, okay, you're going to kick these kids out. I, just, I, I think it's neighborhood kids. You're going to kick them out. You're going to tell them what's up. This isn't your yard. you got to go back home. So I open up the sliding glass door to go into my backyard, and I'm immediately hit with this wall of water and wind. And I realize there's a thunderstorm, and it's knocked the top off my hot tub, and it hit the button somehow and turned on the jets, and there's bushes right by my hot tub <laughs> waving like this. Full-on home alone moment. You, it looks like there's a lot happening, but there's nobody there. <laughs> and I realized I was incredible. There's nobody in my hot tub. My brain made the whole thing up. But think how silly I looked for just a second. Behind this wall, imagine God like, there's nobody in your hot tub, bud. <laughs> but I'm frozen. And as as simple and fleeting, quick as that moment is, I think it's a great representation of how off, too often we feel when we face the unknown. Frozen. And here's what the enemy wants to do in your life. He wants to take your hope, not just because it's connected to your happiness, although God wants you to have a life of joy and fulfillment. The enemy wants to take your hope because it's connected to your purpose, the call of God on your life. And he wants to get you so tied up in things, drama and circumstances and situations and tough relationships that you can't even imagine a God future. You can't even imagine a vision of something better. You say, Ethan, I can't even think about impact because I'm dealing with this. And what the enemy wants to do is take your options, take your hope, and paralyze you. And when we get in that situation, one of the most powerful things we can remember is we're not alone. This is the story of God's people. That over and over again in the Bible, we read of God's people getting to the edge of the unknown and looking across the chasm and going, I don't know how to get from here to there. And God's people have always felt exactly like you feel, exactly how I've felt. I don't know what to do now. In fact, even the guys that walked with Jesus felt this way. Think about this. The disciples were with the Son of God, the guy that beat death, hell, and the grave, and they still found themselves wondering how things were going to work out from time to time. You remember the famous story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people? It's a miraculous story. Jesus steps into this crowd, and miraculously, they all eat a buffet that he created. But right before this amazing miracle, the disciples are sitting there right on the edge of everything they know, and they're looking at each other going, we, we don't know how to fix this. So they go to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, we got to send these people away. They're hungry. They need to go get something to eat. And I love what John writes in John chapter 6. He, he says that he knew what he was going to do, but he, say, he looked at him and said, you feed them. Can you imagine that? Jesus, we don't have anything. We don't, we don't, we don't have anything. But then one of the disciples pipes up, and look at, what, look at what Andrew says in John 6, 8. It says another one of the disciples standing there in this whole scene, Andrew speaks up and he says, actually, gang, that's not entirely true. We don't have nothing, but we don't have much. All we have is this one lunch from this one little kid, and it's just, look at what he says, five small barley loaves and two small fish. And then he says this, but how far will they go among so many? Think of the verbiage that he uses. This is human nature. We tend to minimize what we have in our hand. 
He doesn't just say, hey, Jesus, we have some bread and some fish. He says, we have some small fish. I don't want you to think this is a lot. This is not like a bunch. This isn't a big salmon. This is just a little, little fish and a little loaf. And then he says, but how far will they go among so many? Do you feel that way? Do you look at what you have and the decisions in front of you and just go, I don't know how what I have is going to get me from here to there. I don't understand that. If you're facing the, what the disciples faced, it's what I just described as the hope gap. Everybody faces this. It's this gap between where I am and where I want to be. Here's the, here's the picture. It's not always that I just have no picture of the future. It's that I just, I, often I don't see the steps of how we're going to get there. And when you face that hope gap, you need to remember that the thing that gets you across that hope gap is not having all of the answers. It's having enough faith to start with what you have. Jesus did not look at the disciples and say, you need to perform a miracle. The miracle was not their responsibility. All Jesus said is, give me the little bit that you have and watch what I can do with it. Will you trust me enough to start with what you have? The power of following Jesus in a broken world is that we're a different group of people. We're a group of people that step into the unknown and we say, I don't know how it's going to work out. But I'm going to choose to do what I can right now. And if you want to live in a season of new hope, you're going to have to choose action over inaction when you feel like freezing. And I'm just going to give you five words this morning. This is your homework this week. When you feel stuck or there's somebody in your life that feels stuck, simply do the next right thing. And if you will put those five words into action, as simple as they are, I think you will find God unlocked step two when you're willing to take step one. A couple years ago, I met one of my great friends. Her name is Lena. I talked to her again this week and just asked if I could share her story. Lena caught me in the lobby after a weekend message, and she just said, she said can I just kind of tell you where I'm at? And I, I just need some, I just need some, some help because I don't know what to do. She said... My, my boyfriend and I are, are living together. We've both been through some, some tough relationships. And we both have found faith in Christ. And we know that, I, she said, I know that we probably ought to get married or move out. And, and she said, but I'm, I'm terrified. I have a son. There's this family unit. And I'm scared that the second I start to talk to him about, about moving forward to honor God, he's not going to understand. And, and he's going to be scared. And she said, I'm scared of losing everything. And I said, Lena, just back up. I said, don't worry about the outcome. What's the first step that you would take if you knew God was going to show up? If you knew God could change everything, what would you do? And she said, well, I'd probably just have a conversation. But I said, okay, that's it. All we're going to do is we're going to pray that this week you have an opportunity and the boldness to have a conversation with him. I said, you're, you're going to watch what God does when you just simply step out and do the next right thing. I said, and then after you have the conversation, we're going we're gonna to pray for boldness to do the next thing and the next thing. We had these conversations over months, and, and a couple months later, she came running up to me like a schoolgirl in the lobby. She gave me a big hug, and she said, he's coming to church. He's coming to church. And they got in church. They sat together, and they had conversations, and it didn't change overnight, but they kept doing the next right thing. She caught me a few months after that, and she said, Ethan, we're getting married. And I remember the feeling of standing in front of both of them as they're getting married. Jesus has changed their life. He's changed their future. And just thinking to myself, this all started because one gal was simply bold enough to do the next right thing. And I don't know what you're looking at this week. I don't know how big the financial mountain is. I don't know how tough the relationship is. But if you'll ask Jesus for boldness to do the next right thing, you're going to find him meet you right where he is. You say, Ethan, you don't understand where I am. I don't have loaves and fishes. I've got sardines and wheat thins. I got nothing. Start with what you have and watch God show up. Maybe it's just opening up the envelopes and totaling up the debt. Whew, it's tough. I don't want to face it. I, I, want to, I just want to stay behind the wall. I don't want to step into it and watch what God does. Because I want us to be a church full of people that believe in this principle enough that we challenge each other to do it. That we're friends enough that we can put our arms around each other and say, I know you feel stuck, but I'm in this with you. I'm going to help you do the next right thing. Amen? That's the kind of church that we're going to be. Number two is this. Number two is this. Write it down. Choose replenishment over Netflix. Choose replenishment over Netflix. Now, somebody just got hardness of heart. The spirit of rebellion just came on somebody right now. You're like, preacher, back up off my Netflix. Get your hands off my Grey's Anatomy, brother. You are treading on thin ice. All right, listen. There is nothing inherently wrong with Netflix. You know that. But Netflix is a great cultural label 
that we can put in that place that describes a hundred different things that we use to cope with stress and to distract us from the things that steal our joy. Your life and my life are full of things that rob our joy, steal our joy, and no matter how many good things we're doing in life, here's the reality, hope leaks. You will never go through life with your hope tank full once and it just stays there. Hope always leaks. And when it does, you will always do something to compensate. It's not whether or not you're going to do something to compensate. It's a matter of what you're going to put there to compensate for life stealing your hope. The problem is the natural default of the human heart is to fall into a pattern where instead of replenishment, we put something in its place to medicate or distract us, not really fix it, but distract us from all of the things that are going on in our world. It might not be Netflix for you. Netflix is just a great symbol of coming home after a long day. It's been busy. We've been going, 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 giving, 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 and I just want to turn on something and turn into a puddle and just veg. Can you relate? And for you, it might not be Netflix. For you, it might be a substance. It might be something that you go to to say, man, I just, I got I to, I, 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 there's a hole there's a gap. There, there, I'm empty. I need to fill. Maybe it's alcohol or drugs, prescription medicine. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's sugar. Listen, I don't need a martini, but I will take a Twix all day. Like, like, I, like listen, I will go to stuff to substitute for what God really wants for me. And the problem is that far too many of us are going through this cycle of go, 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 crash, go, 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 crash. And it's like a car going from red line to dead stop, red line to dead stop. And you know if you do that in a car long enough, no matter how nice the car is, you're going to burn out the motor eventually. And your heart, your soul is so much like that. And when you go and stop, go and crash, go and crash, you will eventually burn out because you're not refilling your hope tank. You're not recharging your hope batteries. And you know this inherently. Because Monday morning is not a happy time for most people. They have just crashed for the weekend, and we should be stepping into Monday morning with our best attitude, our best foot forward, lots of energy. But you know most people stumble into Monday morning, and it takes them all the way through Monday to lunchtime before they're even human beings again, right? Why? Because the normal cycle of go and crash does not refill your hope tank. I walked into a convenience store that was by our house the other day. And it's a really cool convenience store. I think it's a God thing. It's a gas station connected to a Burger King because sometimes I need gas and a Whopper, amen? So I walked in, and I'm, I'm, I'm at the register, and over, the, over the, you know, the sound system in this convenience store, there's the old Gloria Gaynor song playing. You know the song, I Will Survive? I, I will survive. As long as I know how to let right's playing in the speaker, I'm just kind of happy, and I get to the I get to the register, and then you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm checking out with you know almonds or something healthy as far as my wife knows, and <laughs> as the as the song gets to the part in the song where um, she says, "Did you think I'd crumble? Did you think I'd just lay down and die?" From the back room of Burger King, everybody frying onion rings shouts out at the same time, "Oh no, not I! I will survive!" And the guy at the register just goes. <sighs> rolls his eyes, and he says, somebody's happy to be at work this morning. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, what a contrast of possibilities. To be in a place full of joy or to be in the same exact place, experiencing the same things, but yet be empty. And I wonder which one you are. Because that cycle of crash, go, crash, go, will never refill you. But yet, God goes out of his way throughout the pages of the Bible to model a different cycle. You were never intended, created by God, to live in that cycle. God has a completely different cycle for us to live in. And I love that Jesus steps into human history and models this for us. Because if there was ever anybody that didn't need to mess with a replenishment cycle, it would be Jesus. He had an excuse. He's only going to be here for three years, and that's all the time he has to change the world. The clock is literally ticking. He could have said, listen, I will sleep when I'm dead. Or... Dead and risen again. You get the point. I can do that later. But instead, over and over again, the Bible tells us that instead of go, go, go and crash, Jesus does something different. He has a different cycle. He withdraws, he refills, and he returns. He withdraws, he refills, 
and he returns. And when Jesus returns, there's no Monday morning hangover with Jesus. When Jesus refills and he returns, things change. Demons flee. Blind eyes are open. The lame walk. The dead live again. When Jesus shows up refilled, life is different. And he looks at it. He does this cycle for us, not just because he knew who he needed it, but because he knew we would need it. And Mark records some of these cycles for us. And I love that Mark records this because as you read through the story of the Bible, you know the four guys that tell us the most about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark writes all about action. Mark wants us to see Jesus like a comet through human history. Over and over again, he's saying, man, when Jesus shows up, things change. He says immediately, straightway, right away, over and over again because he wants us to see Jesus as a man of action. But yet even Mark doesn't miss this about Jesus. Thirteen times in the book of Mark. In fact, if you wanted to go home and read the book of Mark this afternoon, you could do it in an hour and a half. It's that fast. It's like a quick action movie. Thirteen times, Mark tells us that Jesus withdraws, and he refills, and he returns. In one of those places, there's this famous scene where the disciples are returning to where Jesus is, and they're reporting about all the great things they've done. There's progress. The kingdom is moving forward. It's a season of momentum and excitement. It's all good. And this is what he says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 30. All of this is happening, and the apostles gathered around Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. Does that sound like your Tuesday? He said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Come on, a boat by a beach with Jesus. Doesn't that sound like a great Sunday afternoon? Here's what Jesus says. He says, listen, this is all good, guys. This is awesome. But it says they didn't even have a chance to eat. And Jesus looks at us and he says, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of progress, but you are malnourished. And I don't think Jesus is just looking at them and saying that physically. I think he's saying that in their soul, in their spirit, in their mind. You're, I can see your gas gauge of hope going down, and eventually it will hit empty if somebody doesn't step into your world and say, hey, just come away for a little bit. Let's replenish that. Not crash, not burn. Let's actually replenish that. So you say, Ethan, how do I know if I'm actually replenishing that? Nourishment is the key idea here. Replenishment, actually, it doesn't medicate stress. It doesn't distract you from it. It actually helps you rise above it. It changes the posture of your heart. Is there something like that in your life when you do it? You know, my, my heart just shifts. I'm a different person when I do that. Here's a great definition of replenishment. It's just this. When your heart shifts toward gratitude and your joy increases. Now, replenishment is, is a little bit tricky. We could talk about it for hours, the different ways you might replenish yourself. But your replenishment is going to be different than mine. You might play golf and walk out on the golf course and go, man, that was great. I come home and I'm just happy. I'm a better husband, a better friend after I play golf. That's not true for me. I will wrap my golf clubs straight up around a tree and throw them in the pond, baby. I will not be happy after a round of golf. Golf does not replenish me. I like it, but it doesn't really fully replenish me because I'm kind of competitive. So what actually replenishes you? And if you're driving down the road and you're angry at the other drivers, you're getting into arguments with people you love, and you're having fake arguments that haven't even happened yet in your head, and you're just a little bit on edge, you are not replenished. Replenishment shifts your heart. One of the things I discovered this last year is that for Sarah and I, one of the things that replenishes me with her is when we cook together. Now, that kind of surprised me, but it's not just because we like to cook or we like food. And make no mistake about it, I am the sous chef in the kitchen. I'm not in charge, but as long as I know that and I stay in the right box on the flow chart, it's a great time. We like to cook together, but not just because we both like food, but because it changes our conversations. It changes the way we relate to each other. There's a joy in it. There's just something about cutting up meat and cheese and crackers and grapes and like just sitting down and enjoying that together that's replenishing for us. What is that for you? And here's the truth. Even Netflix can be replenishing if you understand the goal. Sarah and I have a, a, a Norwegian cooking show that we discovered. I didn't even know there was such a thing. But Sarah's family is Norwegian, and so watching that for her together brings back memories of living in Norway for a couple of years, and it sparks conversation between us. That sounds like the Swedish chef from, you know, Muppets. It's like, flossom, blossom. It's pretty awesome. And for me, it's informative because I get to learn something more about her family. We have, as friends, sometimes we'll have uh, what we just call bad movie night, not evil, like, 
bad. Like, I just mean, like, it was not a good movie when they made it. Like, I'm talking full, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, bad karate, bad special effects. And we like watching these and making fun of them and laughing together. The form of replenishment is not nearly as important as the effect it has on your heart. For you, it might be a walk in the woods, walk in the park. What is it? So here's your homework this week. If you want to raise your hope level, you're going to have to be able to articulate what your replenishment cycle is. Do you know yours? And if you don't know and you can't articulate or put down on paper what your replenishment cycle is, you're probably living in the other cycle and your hope meter, whether you know it or not, is starting to dip. To dip. So here's a great question for this week. This is your homework. What replenishes me? But not just vaguely, specifically in four categories. And write these down. What replenishes me physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. You're going to find that you have different answers for that. Some of us were talking this week about what our answers to those might be. And for one of us, it's working out is physically, you know, replenishing. For somebody else, it might just be getting outside. I need to be, for me, my personality, I need to be around running water. Man, if I'm around a creek or a waterfall, man, I just feel God in a new way. I just love it. What is that for you? And if you can discover what those are and then strategically work them in, you can be the kind of person that has a great Monday morning. Because here's, here's what's at stake. When you and I walk into a world of darkness, it's not just about our happiness. You and I were built by God to be like a fire hydrant with the lid off, just spraying hope on everybody, walking in Monday morning, just, hi, how you doing? Good to see you. Love you. You're good. God's got a good plan for you. You and I should be the kind of people that change the atmosphere when we walk in a room. When we walk on the hall, God walks on the hall. We're the kind of people that are full of hope. We're the kind of people that can put our arm around somebody struggling and go, baby, it ain't done yet. It ain't done yet. God's got a plan for you. That can never happen if you're not replenished. Number three is this. Choose worship over worry. Choose worship over worry. I think this is the most critical one because I think worry is the greatest enemy of your hope. Hope works like this. Hope looks at your life and it puts together a picture of your future based on who God is. It says, oh man, you know who God is? God's big. God changes things. God creates something out of nothing. God is in control of your future, and it's going to be great. That's hope. Worry does the opposite. Worry comes in, and it wants to put together a picture of your future based on your past and your present circumstances. Worry is like an architect walking into your house, and it wants to unroll blueprints of your future on your dining room table and call you over and go, hey, hey, come look at this. Come look at this. I, I, I built your future for you. I got a little layoff over here. Your, your, your boss has already been talking about downsizing. That's going to happen to you pretty soon. Just wait for that. You're going to love that. Then I got, some, I got some things being said about you behind your back over here. You remember the other day when your friends were laughing? They were laughing at you. That's what was happening. Oh, you're going to hate that. It's going to be great. Look, we're going to put this together. We're going to construct this picture of your future. You remember when you made that mistake in your past and the relationship didn't work out? Yeah, that's going to happen again. Look, look right here. That's about when this is going to happen. It's going to be painful. You know that thing that happened that, that where it was a financial setback? I got three more of those lined up. You want to see what else I got? Worry is an architect that's trying to construct your future so that you get your eyes off of God and onto you. And some of us this week need to walk into that room and fire worry as our architect and just say, listen, you don't get to design my future anymore. My future is going to be in somebody else's hands. But the problem is this. Worry is loud, and worry is constant, and worry sounds like it makes sense, and often worry sounds like you. It sounds like your own voice. It sounds like, yeah, that sounds like something that would happen to me. Yeah, I have made mistakes like that. Yeah, I'll probably make mistakes like that again. Yeah, things are dark. And depending on your personality, if you have a catastrophic view of the future per type of personality, anyway, I have a friend, and every time he walks on the plane, he takes out his, you know, antibacterial soap and his, his, his wipes, and he wipes down everything. And if we hit a little bit of turbulence, he's tightened the belt buckle. In his head, it's over. It's done. He's probably caught a deadly disease from something on the seat. That's his personality. Depending on your personality, worry gets amplified in your life. But worry dies when worship grows. And all throughout the Bible, we see that God's people, when they hit their darkest circumstances, God gave them a weapon in the middle of the storm. And God said, listen, if you'll just worship me right where you're at, your worship will unlock the victory that I have for you. Your worship is a way to shut worry up and, and bring on the victory that I have. It, it, worship is a way that lets me fight your battles for you. Worship is a way that invites me into the middle of your world in a supernatural way to do things you could never do on your own. 
One of my favorite stories of this is in the book of Acts. And after Jesus has died and risen again, the church leaders are trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. And there's this amazing story of two church leaders, and they're, they're doing everything right. They're preaching the gospel, and people are being healed. Miracles are happening. These are good men doing good things, but yet people turn on them. People start gossiping about them. People start spreading rumors about them. People get angry with them. And I can't imagine what that would be like just to be doing everything you feel like is right, but yet the world seems to attack you. And then they go from verbally attacking them to physically attacking them. It says they grabbed Paul and Silas. They stripped their clothes off and they beat them. And after they had beaten them severely, Acts 16 says they were thrown in prison. As they're getting thrown in prison, if everything they've been through isn't enough, the arresting officer looks at the jailers and says, hey, you need to watch them. These are bad guys. Like solitary confinement. These are dangerous men. These aren't dangerous men. That's a lie. People are lying about them. They've been beaten and bruised. And now they're thrown in prison. And here's the picture of Paul and Silas in prison. They get thrown in this inside prison cell. It says they were seated on the floor. And their feet were put in stocks. Here's the picture of Paul and Silas. God had promised them a future. God had set them on assignment, but now it feels like everything has come to a crashing halt. Literally everything, physically their feet, everything in their life that represented the possibility of future progress is now chained and locked behind doors, behind bars, behind guards, and it doesn't look like there's any way out. And I know it can be so easy to look at the Characters in the Bible as heroes of faith, but these were men with feelings and emotions and families. There's people outside these bars that need me, and I may never see them again. I can't imagine how loud worry was in that moment for them. Where's your Jesus now? <laughs> Overcomer? I don't think so. We got you this time. You can't even pace around this jail cell, kid. What are you going to do? You're stuck. I don't know what those bruises and marks would have felt like. I don't know how badly it would have stung, not just their body, but their soul, to be stuck in this moment. I wonder if there's somebody here that can relate. She left. He was supposed to be here. I always thought dad would be around. I didn't plan on that business failing. I can't believe they said that about me. I can't believe this happened. I can't believe my, my body has failed me like this. I, I, I didn't plan on feeling this way. And worry, maybe for you, like Paul and Silas, just rolls out those blueprints and says, hey, welcome, welcome to your future. This is it. It's going to stink. It's jail cells and beatings, things being said about you behind your back. And in that moment with nothing to do, no response, nothing to react to, no way out and nothing that they could physically do to change it. And I can just tell you from my personality, that's aggravating when I feel like there's nothing I can do. And that's where they find themselves. This is what Acts 16, 25 says. It says, then in this moment, about midnight, I love that the writer records that detail because midnight, there's nothing more ominous than midnight. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. It says this, they started singing. Here's the picture that the writer of Acts gives us. At the darkest moment, when there is no way out, physically there's nothing they can do, there is no reaction that looks like it will make any progress, at some point one of them started singing. I don't know who it was. I, I like to think it was Paul because Paul's kind of Paul's feisty. Paul's my kind of guy. He's got a little fight in him. Blood on his back, shirt stripped off, feet in chains. I don't know how that conversation would have gone, but I imagine if it's me and you sitting in a cell, it probably starts off a little bit like, how you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm all right. And I just imagine Paul laughing. <laughs> Feels a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? Feels a little bit like what he must have felt with his body broken for us, giving his life for us. And at some point, he just started praying for Silas. And then he just started singing. With worry turned all the way up, amplified in his ear. 
no reason. He just started worshiping. So I will praise you on the mountain. And I will praise you in the mountains in my way. Probably wasn't singing Hillsong, but you get the idea. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. Silas, this isn't it. We're not done. God's got a plan. I don't know how, but God's going to do something. And then Silas starts singing with them and harmonizing, and it's like Simon and Garfunkel in the prison, baby. They just start singing. Everybody's watching. Everybody's listening. And I don't know when it happened, and I don't know how it felt. But the earth started to shake. The chains fell off. The doors flew open, and they walked out. I guess that wasn't it. I guess worry was wrong. I guess that was a lie. I guess if we're not dead, we're not done. And as they started worshiping, everything changed. But here's how worry works. Worry's always loud. Worship always starts quiet. But you need to learn, as a follower of Jesus, if you're going to have that kind of hope, you have to worship the most when you feel like it the least. And you have to make a choice. I'm going to turn down worry, and I'm going to turn up worship. And watch this. Watch what kind of choice you can make. You hear how the room changes already with them starting to play, starting to sing? A little more faith. A little more hope, a little more confidence. Turn the lights back down. Give me back to worship level. Let's see if this works. Feel what changes in the atmosphere with just a few choices. A few choices and everything starts to feel different. All of a sudden, worry is screaming at you. No, don't worship. It's not going to help. No, don't worship. There's no, there's no hope for you. But when you start to make that choice, things start to change. And I wonder if there's anybody in here this morning that before we go back out to our week, maybe you just need to declare in the darkness with everything chained and everything stuck that this is not the end and God is still good. So we're going to worship again. And I dare you to stand and to declare into the future, this is going to be good because our God is at work. So I will praise you. I will praise you. I will worship you. Let's sing this together. And I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heart ain't gonna save. For I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the sun and where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. facing when you walk out. I don't know what's waiting on you, but when worry comes knocking again, because it might, might on the drive home, might be when you lay your head on the pillow at night, fire it. Fire it again. You don't get to come back. God's got this. Worship again. Worship again. And I'm just believing that in this room, represented by every face, every family, there are stories that are going to be turned around. Relationships, people you haven't talked to in years, things are going to be restored. There's going to be answers for financial problems. There's going to be healing for physical bodies. There's going to be healing for souls where you've dealt with wounds for years. God's hope is real, and I believe that it's rising in our church like never before. And so this morning, just in this holy moment, as a way to respond to what God's doing, if you're here,
Somebody's here this morning. And today was your last shot. I don't know who you are, but you came today and you just said, I, I'm just gonna give it one more try. I, I, I don't know if I have anything past this. God sees you and he loves you and he's proud that you're here. He's gonna meet you right where you are. And if you're here and you just say, Ethan, I just, I just need a little more hope as I go into my week. You're facing an issue that you need wisdom for, restoration, healing. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to know who you are. And if that's you, would you just lift your hand up and say, hey, Ethan, that's me. I could use a little more hope this week. Listen, this is not something to be embarrassed about. This is not admitting, hey, I did something wrong. This is just saying, hey, family, surround me in prayer. Lift me up. Help me have faith that God's going to meet me right where I am. If you're near one of these people, not, don't do anything weird. Just if it's appropriate, put a gentle hand on their shoulder. Let's surround them in prayer. God, we love you so much, and we're so thankful that we don't ever walk through anything alone. And I just declare that this is the beginning of the victory. We don't know how it's going to work out, but we choose to praise you right now. And just like Paul and Silas, we're not praising you so that the chains fall off. The power of our worship is that we're worshiping you if the chains never fall off. And we believe that you're good, and you're real, and your promises stand. So we just ask that you would show yourself real in the lives of every person that's raised their hand today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. If you're here, I think it would be a shame to be in a moment like this and not give you the opportunity to start or restart a relationship with God. You say, then I don't have a relationship with God, but man, I want more of Him. I want to walk with Him. I want to follow Him. And if you showed me how, I'd, I'd give Him my life. I'd be all in. Or maybe you say, Ethan, I've done that, but man, I'm not walking close with God. I'd, I'd like to restart my relationship with God today. What better way to start than this? We'd love to help you do that. So what we're going to do before we dismiss is we're going to pray what we call our believer's prayer. We do this to close every one of our services because it's us declaring that Jesus is who he said he is, that he died and rose again, and he's coming back for his church. And we believe that. We put all of our faith in that. And as we pray this, if you join in, you pray this with us. It's going to be the first thing you do as part of, our new, part of your new family, part of our family. We'd love to help you take that step. So why don't you pray this after me, church. Say this, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I believe he died and rose again so that I could have new life. I will follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's put our hands together and celebrate with everybody that just joined our family. We're so proud of you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to dismiss in about 30 seconds. And when we walk out these doors, here's what I want you to do. Go to one of the tables right outside that says, I raised my hand. Tell them that you did that. I want to give you this. It's our free gift to you. It's the book of John. But not only is it part of the Bible, it also has a way for you to follow along that I think will help you as you follow Jesus in a new way. We want to help you do that, so don't miss that. And then here's, here's, what, I, here's what I feel. Can I Listen. I'm just gonna kind of declare something over Church on the Move if that's okay for just a second, I feel it, okay. I don't know if you can tell, but God's doing something special in our church. And this next season is not only gonna be meaningful, I believe, for you and your family, but I believe Jesus wants to unleash something on our city, but it's gonna take all of us to share this simply by saying, hey, you should be a part of this, get in here with us. And we have a couple of ways as we're going into this next thing that I think this next season, that I think are perfect for us to share the hope that God's stirring in us. And the first is going to happen on Wednesday night right here in this room at 6.30. We're going to have our first Wednesday service. We have an incredible speaker coming in. I'm going to be here. Gabe's going to be here. Witt's going to be here. I'm telling you, it's going to be a powerful service, and it will be life-changing for people if you bring them. I promise you, you're going to love it. So be here on Wednesday. Bring somebody with you. And then Vision Weekend is August 17th and 18th. And on August 18th, uh, Witt's going to be unveiling what God has put on our hearts for this next year. And I'm telling you, what God wants to do is so stinking awesome. You need to be here. But listen, it's not an insider weekend. This is a perfect chance for you to bring somebody and help them, and just help them be in on the beginning of this next season. You're not going to regret it. It's going to be amazing. So bring somebody with you, and we'll see you there. Let me pray a blessing over you, and we'll go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Go out and have a great week. We'll see you next time.